with me, your man, Louis T. Welcome to the command post. You know what it is. Post up. Take command. I, of course, am your commander in chief, Louis T. Thank you for joining me. So I've kind of had this idea in the tuck for a minute now. And I think this is a good time to kind of unleash it. And we've had similar conversations to this, but we've never had a full on discussion about it in this manner. And so I wanted to bring this to your doorstep and hear your responses to see how you felt. So I've split these two categories up into surprises and disappointments. And honestly, these five players in the surprise category, the premise here is if these players perform above expectations, which will you be most surprised by? Because I think every single one of these guys are coming off of either a rough go of it last season or they just haven't shown the ability to play at a high enough level that warrants us to think that they're capable of playing at a pseudo Pro Bowl level or above the level that we would hope that they could have played when we first drafted them, right? So that's going to be the surprise category. And I want you to tell me which one of these scenarios would surprise you the most, okay? Then on the back half of this episode, I'm going to talk about disappointments, potential disappointments, right? These are players that last year, again, last year was full of disappointments. Last year was full of players not living up to expectations and just simply not getting it done. With that said, there were still some guys that hit milestones and markers, and there are some guys playing for contracts this year, things of that nature. And so the disappointment category is going to essentially be, would you be disappointed, which you would be, who would you be most disappointed in or what would you be most disappointed in with these five uh, players in their situations? Which one would make you the most disappointed? I think I know. I know this fan base. I know uh, th this family that we've cultivated. I think I know what most of you are going to say, but I'm going to ask it anyway. OK, so that'll be on the back end of this episode. So let's start with the surprises. All right. So. I got five players in mind for this particular category. And if you can think of someone better in a different situation that might be better than the five that I've come up with, please, by all means, leave it down in the comment section. I'd love to uh, hear about it. And I may agree with you. I may say, you know what? I missed that one. You know, that one might be actually better than the ones I came up with. But uh, for the purposes of this exercise, let's start with Fedarian Mathis. This guy's done absolutely nothing as a second round pick since being drafted out of Alabama back in 2022. Uh, injuries have really been a large part of why he hasn't been able to show what he is or isn't capable of. And so we've gotten to the point now where we don't even add him in the mix when we talk about the defensive tackle position. And we talk about the Bama wall. We added Johnny Newton. A lot of you prefer... Um, John Ridgway over for Darian Mathis at this point. I don't know if they're even keeping five defensive tackles or not this season. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what they do with that particular position because I think that's one of the few that we actually have, you could argue, too many. And if they're going to cut and trim off a bit of fat, that may be one of the positions where there is a tough decision that has to be made because again, I think our roster is flexible enough that if you like a player you can keep him at the expense of another position because we're just not talented enough, i.e. wide receiver. We just don't have enough talent at receiver to me, at least right now, and maybe that changes this summer, where you have to keep a certain amount of receivers to meet a quota, whereas with the defensive tackle, or you go in another tight end, you might not have enough talent there. I think you do have enough talent there, but we're going to see, right? We'll see how it, all this kind of plays out in the summer. Uh, but there are other positions where you may look at, we used to be able to trim off fat at linebacker. Like, we don't got shit at linebacker. So you cut off, you know, two or three of those dudes and and keep that extra defensive tackle. I don't know what they're going to do, but Fedarian can make it tough, right? What if Fedarian Mathis comes out and, again, I don't know how he's going to get on the field even if he makes the team to do this. Again, and I'm not going to speak anything into, you know, fr fruition. I'm not going to talk anything crazy into happening. But let's just say he makes this roster, which 
it's not a for it's not a foregone conclusion, but it's not that far fetched that he makes the team. He is a, a former second round pick, uh, after all, and he's only in year three. He's got plenty of time left on that rookie deal, so I could see him making this team. That said, let's say he plays this season and he gets six sacks, and he's constantly in the backfield. He's a dominant run defender when he plays. And let's say he's not playing a ton of snaps, right? Let's say he's only playing 37% of the snaps, but he's making the most of his opportunities in this defense with Dan Quinn and Joe Witt Jr. And they're moving these guys around. And, and he's one of these beneficiaries of getting out there, being fresh. And they're, they're, they're blitzing guys. Frankie Lubu's coming and Jamin Davis is out there rushing. And, you know, Doran Armstrong is doing his thing. Deron and everybody. And he's out there. When he gets out there and he gets his opportunity, he's making the most of it. Would that surprise you the most? That for Darian Mathis shows why he was a second round pick. Six sacks. Eight tackles for loss on the season. In 37% of the snaps. Really maximizing his snaps and being highly efficient as a football player. Something we haven't seen from him. He hasn't even been available. The best ability is availability. He hasn't even been that the first two years of his career. So that in itself would be a surprise if he can just stay healthy, right? Let alone six sacks, eight tackles for loss, just a, a constant pest in the backfield when he is in the game, flashing every time he gets an opportunity. The next guy, De'Ami Brown. Final year of his rookie contract, year four. A lot of you don't even think he's going to make the team. I think he will be. On this roster, John Kahn seems to think that he'll be on this roster as well. I don't see any reason why he shouldn't be again unless we get to training camp and into the preseason and some of these young boys are just balling at the receiver position and it's like, okay, Diami is, he's expendable. You can move on from him. I don't see that taking place. I think he's a part of this group this season. And what if finally the light bulb comes on for him he gets more opportunities in this Cliff Kingsbury offense where they're going to spread teams out a bit, right? Get the ball quickly out of a young quarterback's hands into the playmaker's hands. Let's say that Diami finally shows why he was a third-round pick out of UNC. Let's say that this is the year that Diami finally decides, hey, I'm a legitimate NFL wide receiver, and here's what I can do. And he goes out. And he has a 697, so essentially 700 yards. But we'll go 697 receiving, five touchdowns. And this is done on just 33 catches. So that means he's showing explosive ability, right? Ball touches his hands and he's making things happen. Would you be more surprised by Deami Brown's Outburst in his fourth season. He doesn't even have 697 yards combined in his first three seasons. He probably doesn't have five touchdowns combined in his first three seasons. I could be wrong about that. He had two in one game against the Titans last year. I don't, and he had the Seahawks or two, two years ago. And then in the Seahawks game, he caught a touchdown pass last year. I, I don't know if he's scoring any more touchdowns. I don't know if he scored any as a rookie. He may have scored one as a rookie. Maybe two. You know, he may have five touchdowns on, in his career right now. Something worth looking up. Would you be more surprised by him having that type of a season in year four with, you know, Jahan supposed to getting, uh, get Jahan probably being more of a focal point of the offense, Terry getting back to business, Luke McCaffrey jumping in and maybe stealing some opportunities from him. Would you be more surprised if Diami was able to have that type of season? More so than Fedarian Mathis. Next guy up, Benjamin St. Juice. I actually think you could put Benjamin St. Juice in the disappointed category, but for the, the purposes of this exercise, I think he belongs here in the surprise category because he was trending towards being a piece that was worth holding on to. Fresh off that 2022 campaign, um, you know, him and Defoe in that secondary, you could argue, we're, we're heading up trajectory-wise, and we felt really good about those two pieces in particular in the secondary. 
You know, Juice went toe to toe with Justin Jefferson, and even though Justin got his, so did Juice. And he played his ass off, and he battled, and he went toe to toe with him, and he held his own. I watched him battle with AJ Brown and get the best of AJ Brown at times. I watched him battle with you know Devonte Smith and get the best of him at times. I watched this man in 2022 answer the call week after week after week, and I think we started to feel like, hey, ha ha, Juice is locking him up. Might not catch the damn ball, might not pick shit off, but. Juice is going to be there, and he's going to have a chance to have a bunch of PBUs. Last year was rough. <laughs> Last year scared us straight. <laughs> I mean, any Juice supporters out there went running and hiding last year. By, by the time the wreckage was done after last season, there weren't many Juice stands out there. Nobody was standing 10 toes down for Benjamin St. Juice. Everybody was, you know, ducking and seeking cover. So at this point, Benjamin St. Juice, going into the last year of his deal, similar to De'Ami Brown, he's going to have to prove it. And what if in this new scheme that we think is going to be very friendly to these secondary members, we've seen guys in other stops have tremendous seasons playing the cornerback position with this group in front of them, with the defensive scheme and the aggressive mindset that you're going to get from Joe Witt, that you're going to get from Dan Quinn, the secondary could be the biggest beneficiaries of what is to come defensively for this team. And a guy like Benjamin St. Juice could be a guy in a contract year that fits what they want to do and is able to finally showcase what he's capable of doing. I'm not sure he's capable of catching the football consistently. Hasn't shown that at any level. But what if Benjamin St. Juice led the team in interceptions with four this season, was damn near a lockdown corner, played against some of the best, and we're going to see a lot of good teams and a lot of good receivers, and he might be you know, called upon in many instances to play against some of these better receivers that we'll see on the schedule. There is a Jamar Chase on the schedule. There is an Amari Cooper on the schedule. Obviously, A.J. Brown, just in the division, A.J. Brown twice, C.D. Lamb twice, and oh, by the way, the Giants just drafted this kid named Malik Neighbors, and he looks damn good too. So what if Juice comes out here, tackles well, you know, 14 PBUs, four interceptions, and is just an absolute dynamo at the cornerback position. Would that surprise you more than Diami having 697 yards receiving and five touchdowns on 33 catches and really showing what the last group thought he could be as an explosive playmaker? Would that trump Fedarian Mathis's six sacks, eight tackles for loss, and just being a menace? up front on the defensive line. What says you? We move on to the next guy, Percival Butler. We've talked a lot about the safety position. We've talked a lot about Jeremy Chen and his acquisition. We've talked a lot about uh, Quan Martin and his new role and him probably seeing an extensive role, right? An expansion of what he was last year as a rookie. And, and how high they are on him. And they seem like the two starting safeties. Um, we've even talked about Defoe returning to the lineup. And when they go three, you know, safeties, because we're going to see a lot of three safety looks, Defoe probably being the guy that's on the field. What about Percival Butler? What about Percy? You know, this is a guy that was a former, you know, third, fourth round pick. One of those two rounds that they were very, very high on. Well, not they. The last group was very high on. He can run. He can cover. He can do a lot of different things, right? What if this group is able to get the most out of Percy Butler? He's got a unique set of skills. I think he's better as a guy attacking the line of scrimmage and then also being able to, to play coverage and, and be in space. He's, he's a guy that can get to the football very quickly, right? Now, what he does when he gets there, <laughs> all bets are off. We saw last year, not tackling is not his best strong suit, right? Not the, the best trait and quality that you get from Percy Butler. He turned into Percival quite a bit last year in those situations. Um, however, 
What if he cleans all of that up this year? What if he ends up being a guy that they find out, hey, he can do a lot of things. And similar to Jeremy Chin, they they put in packages where he's a blitzer. He's coming down, attacking the line of scrimmage, tackles for loss. You know, he's rallying to the football. Ball gets tipped in the air. He picks it off and goes the distance, right, with that speed. What if Percy Butler jumps in the mix, has three sacks this year, a couple of pass breakups, two interceptions, one of them for a touchdown, what if Percy Butler turns into that type of a player? This, this Swiss Army knife guy that can do so many different things. Would that surprise you? More so than Benjamin St. Juice, four interceptions, you know, 13 pass breakups, tackling machine, holding down a lot of the better receivers this year that he sees. More so than De'Ami Brown, 697 yards receiving, five touchdowns, 33 catches, Shows the explosive ability. For Darian Mathis, six sacks on only 37% of the snaps. Eight tackles for loss and just being a defensive presence when he is in the game. And then lastly, Jamin Davis. This is a contract year for him. They did not pick up the fifth year option. I think there's a, a little bit of a buzz around Jamin Davis right now. What if the last group failed to see what Jamin Davis's true superpower was, which is getting after the quarterback? How many times did we say as a fan base, Jamin Davis should be blitzing more? He should be going after the quarterback. I know I was saying that. I can't speak for any of you. Yes, he's fast and yes, he's, he can do certain things, but let's not just limit him to dropping into coverage to being, being a reactionary linebacker. Let him attack. That's what I used to always call for. Well, this group has come in and they said, hey, we've seen enough of you at linebacker and we got other guys in front of you. You're not going to play as much if those guys come in here and do the things that we know they're capable of doing. So we're going to try to find ways to get you on the field and see if you have the ability to maybe make some money in this league as a guy that can get after the quarterback. What if Jamin Davis's real superpower was being buried this entire time and Jamin Davis is a badass as a pass rusher? <laughs> what if in his first season as a pass rusher, Jamin Davis gets eight and a half sacks, right? And a bunch of quarterback hits and hurries and is just a nuisance as a pass rusher, like legitimately as a you know situational pass rusher, Jamin Davis gives you eight and a half sacks, He's getting to the quarterback consistently, and it changes everything for you. Like, wouldn't that blow your mind? It would blow mine, right? Would that surprise you more than Percy Butler just being an all-around player, three sacks, two interceptions, one of them going for a touchdown, you know, couple few tackles for loss and just being a, a a really good all-around player which is what they drafted him to be or the last group did Benjamin St. Juice four interceptions 13 pass breakups tackling machine and going toe-to-toe -to -toe with some of the best the NFL has to offer Deami Brown 697 yards receiving five touchdowns 33 catches, really showing what he can do as a wide receiver in his final year of his contract. Or for Darian Mathis, six sacks on only 37% of the snaps, eight tackles for loss, and really taking full advantage of finally being healthy, one, and two, the snaps that he gets around all of these different um, playmakers and guys that can, you know, really uh, command attention he is the guy that, much like when he was in college, when his final year, he had 10 sacks at Alabama. He was the biggest beneficiary of all the activity around him. He was the one no one was paying attention to, and he found his way in the backfield and made plays. Who would be the biggest surprise for you? If these things took place, which one would surprise you the most? Leave it down in the comment section. Maybe there's one I didn't mention that you think is an even better one. 
Leave it down in the comment section. Love to hear your thoughts. We'll take a quick break, get a word from one of our sponsors, and then on the other side, we'll come back and we'll tackle the disappointed category. It's official. School's out. Sun's out. It's summer. And usually what comes with summer is heat and funk. But the latter doesn't have to. This summer, beat odor to the punch with Mando Whole Body Deodorant. Make Mando Whole Body Deodorant your best friend this summer. It's clinically proven to control odors for 72 hours. It's safe for the whole body. Pits, package, feet. My personal favorite, your grundle. <laughs> it stops odors before they start. And it's available in four cologne quality scents. Bourbon Leather, Pro Sport, Clover Woods, and my personal favorite, Mount Fuji. So check this out. Mando Starter Pack is perfect for new customers. It comes with a solid stick deodorant, cream tube deodorant, and two free products of your choice like mini body wash or deodorant wipes. And free shipping. I just used the word free twice in one sentence. Who doesn't like free? Luckily, I have a discount code to help you get hooked on my favorite smelling whole body deodorant on the market. New customers get $5 off of a starter pack that equates to over 40% off of your starter pack. Use promo code LouisT at shopmando.com. That's promo code LouisT at shopmando.com. S H O P M A N D O.com. Sometimes the summer heat stinks, but you don't have to. Get Mando and stay fresh all summer long. So let's go to the other side of the coin, right? These are players that either you would be disappointed in them or the situation, right? So I want to start with Emmanuel Forbes. Clearly coming off of a disappointing rookie campaign, <clears throat> he's one of the guys that we hope this new staff can breathe life into and re- instill confidence into this kid who came in here as a very confident player. They said they liked him coming out of Mississippi State last year, and they were fans of his game. And there's always going to be the comparison between him and Gonzo in New England. And before Gonzo got hurt last year, he looked like he was a budding star at the cornerback position. So there's always going to be this comparison between the two of them and what we could have had had we just taken the guy that was the better player coming out of college in terms of looking like he was ready to transition to the NFL. That said, they love guys who can take it away. Forbes can take it away. Could he have a Deron Bland type of ascension? We'll see. But would you be disappointed if it was much of the same from Emmanuel Forbes, and we could have easily put him in the surprise category, but I, I don't think a guy that was drafted in the first round, we should be surprised if he goes out and plays at a very high level. That's why he was the first round pick. So would you be disappointed? Yes, you would be disappointed. Would you be most disappointed, however, if it was much of the same from last year, guy that lacked confidence, too small to be, to to hang in there with the bigger receivers that push him around, make plays on him. He's lost. He can't find the football. Um, he's, he's, he's not a, a great tackler. And he just looks like he's out of sorts and that this league and the physicality that comes with it is just way too much for him to handle. He looks overwhelmed. Would you be disappointed, most disappointed, if Deron Payne didn't, go back to his contract year form of 2022, where he was arguably one of the best defensive tackles, not just in the NFC, but in all of the National Football League. He was a force and without question, the best player on this team in 2022. I was disappointed. I think some of you set the bar way too low for certain players. Because you like them and, you know, you don't want to blame them. F that. Deron Payne showed me what he's capable of in 2022. Nothing else will do for me now. 
And with this new group coming in here and them talking about feeding the studs, well, Deron Payne is a stud. And if what they say is true, I expect him to not only eat, but eat savagely this season. I'm expecting no less than nine sacks from Deron Payne. And I'm expecting Deron Payne to be a menace in the backfield, constantly applying pressure to opposing teams, running backs and quarterbacks. And being a guy that teams just have a problem blocking and dealing with on a snap in, snap out basis. I expect him to play less snaps so he'll be fresher. So I expect him to be able to go out there and dominate at the level that his talents suggest that he should. And I think this is the right group to get it out of him. Would you be disappointed if we saw the Deron Payne that we saw last year? The one that only got four sacks. The one that at times flashed but wasn't consistently flashing enough. Didn't seem like a guy that you necessarily had to double team or that you had to really focus in on. He was just one of the guys out there. Not a dude, a stud, but just a guy. Would you be more disappointed if that was what we got from Deron Payne this year or if what we got from Emmanuel Forbes in his rookie season repeated again This season, which one would make you more disappointed? Next guy up, Terry McLaurin. Our our, our one guy that we can rely on. Terry is currently working on four consecutive thousand yard seasons. To be exact, he's working on four consecutive thousand yard seasons with at least 75 catches. What if he doesn't make a thousand this year? How disappointed would you be? Would you be more disappointed? And again, this is assuming health. Nothing's wrong with him. He just didn't get to 1,000 yards this year. You know, somebody else may have emerged. Other guys may have gotten the football. You know, the quarterback situation, you know, might have been, I won't say a mess, but it might have been where, because look, Jaden Daniels may only throw for 2,900 yards this year. If that's the case, you may not have a thousand yard receiver. If he's throwing it to the backs, if he's throwing it to the tight ends, if he's spreading around at the receiver position, may not have a thousand yard receiver. What if Terry doesn't go for a thousand this year and his four year streak is broken? Would you be more disappointed in that happening? Deron Payne not playing up to his status and level that we know he can play at, or Forbes continuing to struggle? in his second year as a former first-round pick? Which one would you be most disappointed in? Next one up, Jahan Dotson. This is a make-or-break year for Jahan Dotson. There is no doubt about it. This is the year where you determine if you're going to pick up the fifth-year option. This is the year that you determine if this kid is good enough to play at this level as a number one-ish or a dominant number two type receiver. This is the year you find out if Jahan Dotson is worth the price of admission. You spent a first round pick. He has first round talent. Are you able to get it out of him? And he may return punts this season. That'll be interesting to see what they decide to do with him. So he may add even more value to what he can already bring to the table as a pass catching wide receiver. But if last year is any indication of what's to come, then he'll turn into a bust. His rookie season showed so much promise, and I think that's who he really is. Had he not gotten hurt in his rookie season, he would have been pushing towards 1,000, and he would have eclipsed 10 touchdowns. So if he gets back to that level, stays healthy, and plays at that level then we're going to get the guy that we drafted as a first-round pick. But what if those things don't happen? What if health is an issue? What if he's inconsistent? What if he's doing a bunch of cardio again? What if there are drops? What if De'Ami Brown has more yards receiving than him? How disappointed would you be? Would you be more disappointed in that, knowing that, okay, he's not what I thought he was, probably going to need to upgrade the receiver. Now you probably need Brandon Ayuk if he becomes available. 
Would you be more disappointed in, in Terry not getting to 1,000 yards? Would you be more disappointed in Deron Payne not getting back to that 2022 status and level of play? Or would you be more disappointed in Emmanuel Forbes continuing to show that he is not worthy of being a starting caliber corner in this league and not worthy of the first round pick? And we should have gone with Gonzalez. And then lastly, Sam Cosme, up for a contract. He's the one guy on the offensive line that we have immense confidence in right now. He played like a bona fide Pro Bowl type player last year. But it was only one year. He was healthy, really for the first time in his career. And he played a new position and he dominated. Especially once he got comfortable as the season wore on. All expectations and all signs point to him picking right up where he left off last year. There's no reason for us to feel like he won't. But what if he doesn't? (laughs) What if he doesn't? On a line right now that is in flux, that we don't know who our starting left tackle or guard is going to be. We don't love the right tackle. And all we right now really have is a center that we got from another team that we feel like is going to come in and play well in Cosme. And if he can't give us what we need, oh my God, what are we going to do up front? What if he reverts back to the inconsistent, can't stay healthy Sam Cosme that we met in the first couple of years of his career and weren't wholly fond of? Would that disappoint you more than Jahan struggling to to settle into his role as a legit number two, pseudo number one wide receiver? Would that disappoint you more than Terry McLaurin not hitting his 1K milestone and marker for the fifth consecutive year? Would that disappoint you more than Deron Payne not returning back to 2022 form? Or would that disappoint you more than, say, Emmanuel Forbes looking like a first round bust at the cornerback position? Which one of those situations would disappoint you the most? So you've got which would surprise you the most. Now you have what would disappoint you the most. And if I left something out, if there's a player that you think could be on that list that would trump all of the ones that I just gave you. Leave it down in the comment section. I'd love to read it. But you've got your choices now. What would surprise you the most? Fedarian Mathis, Deami Brown, Benjamin St. Juice, Percival Butler, or Jamin Davis. What would disappoint you the most? Emmanuel Forbes, Deron Payne, Terry McLaurin, Jahan Dotson, or Sam Cosby? Leave it down in the comment section. Can't wait to read your responses. I'll give you my response. I'll read some of these responses on the air. We'll go live on Monday night. We'll talk about this topic. We'll talk about some of the things that were said in the comment section. Go over some of those comments, the ones that I thought were the most thought-provoking. We'll read those. We'll react to some of them. And I'll give you my thoughts. I'll pick my surprise, I'll pick my disappointing, uh, you know, which one would be the most disappointing for me. And we'll discuss that as well, as well as any comments that you might have in the comment section. So I hope you enjoy this video, this exercise, and I look forward to chopping up with you on the other side of the weekend. You guys take care. Have a good one. See you next time. Mm -hmm.